Hey, Pilot Geek here, and today we're going to be turning this small form factor office PC into a budget gaming rig. Small form factor desktops are pretty common in the business world. When it's time for companies to upgrade, these older machines usually get sold off at a heavy discount. eBay is usually littered with them, and a machine such as this can be found for under $100. If you're short on cash, it pays to ask around, as sometimes people simply want to discard older machines without paying recycling fees or dealing with selling them. In fact, this machine in particular was given to me by a local small business. The most difficult part of upgrades will be finding a cheap small form factor graphics card. Full-size graphics cards are usually cheaper than their half-height counterparts, so you may have to wait around until you find a good deal. I've used the GT1030 in past builds, but I decided to try another budget option. I haven't tried it before, but the AMD R7350X I will be using for this build. Seems any pre-Polaris cards are going pretty cheap, and this card cost me less than $60, so I figured I'd give it a try. For someone wanting to play older games or something simple like Minecraft, Sims, or emulators, this card should be more than enough. Let's get this thing opened up. As you can see, it's a bit dusty inside. I've definitely seen worse, but the fan looks pretty clogged. I usually keep a can of compressed air on hand, and it usually does the job quite well, though sometimes especially stubborn dust bunnies may need a little bit more encouragement to remove. I'll be sticking with the same CPU, but we're going to clean up and replace the old thermal paste. This isn't strictly necessary, but it can definitely help with thermals on an older machine if the old stuff is all dried up. With the CPU cleaned, we can see that this PC is running an AMD A8-8650 CPU. Definitely not the best, but it's sort of a decent match with the AMD R7350X that I bought. There's a lot of guides on how to properly apply thermal paste, but in reality you can really just kind of gob it on there and let the force of the heatsink spread it out. Next, I'll add some memory, and this already had a 4GB stick installed so I'll add a matching one in the corresponding slot. Most memory slots have some sort of color coding to indicate which memory channels are being paired, so try to keep similar size and speed of memory paired up. To install the video card, I'll simply open up this bracket, gently set it into the PCI Express slot, and snap it down. Older small capacity SSDs are a great performance upgrade for cheap. I paired the SSD with the standard desktop hard drive that I had in a parts bin. Luckily, this PC has both a 2.5 inch hard drive bay and a 3.5 inch bay. In the past, I have 3D printed brackets for SSDs, but proper adapters also exist. Both of these drives can pretty much be routed to any SATA connector, though depending on the motherboard, certain ports may have higher speeds if they're split between multiple controllers. I probably should have checked this before putting all this stuff in, but yep, it does make it to the BIOS. Okay, so now that we have our hardware set up, let's get into the software side of things. In this case, this computer came with Windows 7 Pro license sticker on the side of it. I usually install Windows 10, which will usually activate just fine as an upgrade license, even when doing a clean install. You can easily make a flash drive of the installer from the official Microsoft Media Creation Tool, linked in the description. Once we have Windows 10 installed, we're going to make sure we have all the correct drivers. Windows Update usually does a pretty good job of this, but I'm going to install the full AMD driver package to ensure best performance. We'll also configure our secondary hard drive as the default documents location. Well, I think I found out why this was free. The onboard Ethernet does not work. So I went ahead and ordered a proper PCI Express Ethernet adapter, along with a Wi-Fi adapter. It won't be here for a while, so for now I'm using a USB to Ethernet adapter. Well, now onto the fun part, the customization. To add a little bit of flair, and because gaming, I'm going to paint this case, add a little bit of lighting, and then a side panel window. I like that most HP small form factor front panels are modular. No masking required here. All I need to do is give it a good cleaning set the paint sticks. We'll just split everything down into its components, clean with a bit of soapy water, and then let it dry. 
While I'm waiting for the water to dry, I'll cut a window in the case. I found in testing that this little CPU actually runs pretty hot, so an intake right above the CPU may do it some good. This is a little bit overkill, but I'm using a 120mm carbide hole saw. This makes quick work of cutting a hole, and it's definitely a lot more efficient than using a Dremel and a ton of cut-off wheels. After the hole is cut, I'll use some sandpaper to finish it up so it's not too sharp. When painting, make sure you do light and even coats. I found that this particular paint coats extremely well, so I'll probably only do two or three coats. I'm also painting this little release latch because, well, I scratched it. I also like to add a carrying handle to my small form factor builds for portability. For this build, I'm using a repurposed kayak handle. First, I'll use the handle to mark the spots that I want to drill. Next, I'll use some paper towel to protect the inside from shavings while drilling some pilot holes. Then we'll finish up the holes to the final size. Just to be safe, I'm blowing out the case to get rid of any leftover shavings. To secure the handle to the case, I'm using M4 nuts and bolts. Well, we can't exactly have a giant hole in the case, so to make the case window look a little bit more finished, I've 3D printed a ventilation grill. My wife was also nice enough to use a Cricut to cut final AMD decals. To stand it upright, I'm also printing some pads and TPU so we can stand it up without scratching the case. For lights, I'll be using some strip LEDs. These ones are just generic red 12 volt strips and have a sticky backing to them. I'm going to be soldering them to a SATA connector to keep everything modular, but you could really just cut and splice directly to the power supply. For those who don't care to solder, I'd recommend using some pre-made lights, which I found were actually pretty cheap on Amazon. After getting the lights rigged up, I'll mount them into the case using the sticky backs. Well, all in all, I think this turned out looking pretty great. I don't think it's too flashy, and the cosmetic upgrades really weren't that expensive. Well, with everything set up, now comes the big question. How does it actually game? Well, first off, we'll test a relatively new title, Fortnite. I'm running at 1440x900 on low settings, using DirectX 11. I tried DirectX 12, but it seemed kind of glitchy for me. Using the Radeon overlay, I found that we're mostly CPU limited, with the GPU sitting at around 60% most of the time, spiking up to 100 only when there's more action. Because we're CPU limited, the frame times were all over the place. After limiting to 30 frames per second, the gameplay was smooth and relatively playable. Next I'm going to play one of my favorite games, 2016's Doom. I actually didn't have much hope for this one, but it is playable. I'm running the game at 1440x900 with a 50% resolution scale on low settings. I do get over 30 frames in most areas, but it seems to have a weird stutter occasionally. Despite using a relatively underpowered GPU, I think we're actually hitting a CPU bottleneck in this game as well. Next we'll have a look at Rocket League. I definitely didn't think that this would be a problem, and as you would expect it runs totally fine. In fact, running on high settings at 1440x900 worked great, I was hitting 60 frames per second the whole time. Older games, indie games, and esports titles may actually be where the system shines. Obviously, 2D games like Castle Crashers, one of my personal favorites, are no problem for this machine. Other games like Overcooked, Cuphead, etc. would probably run just fine as well. Lastly, I wanted to try some simple GameCube emulation. I didn't really think this would be much of an issue, as I've run the Dolphin emulator on less capable hardware, and sure enough, this works as intended. For less than $200, you can definitely build a decent entry-level PC. I think this build turned out pretty well. It's not super powerful, but it looks cool and it's great for some older games or more simple games. Maybe you don't know if you like PC gaming or you just don't have the money for a more expensive machine, but upgrading an older office PC is always a great budget option in my opinion. In this case, the total was only around $100, even with the added Ethernet and Wi-Fi adapters, so always be on the lookout for people just wanting to dump older hardware for cheap or free. Well, thanks for watching. Hopefully you liked the video. If you want to see more computer videos, please hit the like button and make sure to subscribe. I have a few older Retro 386 and Socket 7 PC builds I'd eventually like to show off, so maybe that'll make for a good video.